My name is David Morton. Uh, I'm here representing the McDonald Genome Institute. We're here in town. Uh, we do genomic research. We're part of the Washington University uh, conglomeration. Uh, Michael uh, Koala is also going to help me present. Uh, we do a lot of uh, research into the genomics of cancer and Alzheimer's and, and non-human uh, genomes as well. And so we, uh, we obviously face a lot of computational challenges, both in like how do you do that, but also how do you orchestrate the processes that do that. And so there's a couple of levels of difficulty that we have. One of the uh, systems that we're building to solve the orchestration process is this uh, pro, uh, the system called Taro. And so today we wanted to give you uh, sort of an overview of what Taro is. And I wanted to um, kind of start with the history of Taro. So what you're in for, what we think that we can do in the time that we have is talk about the history and background for about 15 minutes start you off talking about the modeling system that we use to analyze genomes, um, and then how we've sort of pulled from that the uh, workflow engine, and then we're progressively making that more and more service-oriented. Um, Michael's gonna talk to you about the architecture of Taro, and he'll talk about the services, what they do, how they interact with one another. He'll give you a realistic example to uh, to sort of show some of the nice features that we have. Uh, lastly, we're gonna talk about the uh, development and testing as well as our deployment really quickly. If we have time, I'll show you a really fast little live demo. Uh, the whole system runs in a, in a small VM. The um, ulterior motives for giving this talk are that maybe somebody in the audience will find something um, also useful about Taro and wanna contribute or um, maybe point out something that we missed. And so, um, without further ado, let's do some history. So, a little bit of background about, about what we do at MGI. Uh, we do a lot of uh, human, I'm gonna move the cursor. Uh, we do a lot of uh, human genetics, and so that typically starts with some people in a lab, sample, uh, preparing a sample for sequencing um, sequencing is now a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's all sort of geared towards these giant sort of computer boxes that have all the wet lab in them as well, and they spit out essentially short reads of DNA, usually about 100 base pairs long. And those then need to be aligned back to the human reference. So you might remember uh, back in 2003 or so, we did this thing called the Human Genome Project, and that was to just like figure out what is the letters of A's and C's and T's and G's that make up the entire human genome. And so that isn't everybody's genome, that's like four people's genome roughly, but it gives you a scaffold to put all of these short reads onto. And so there's a handful of tools that can do this for you. Um, it's active area of research to do that kind of thing. Uh, we don't do that a lot at MGI, but we orchestrate a lot of that work. And so we do, we're sort of, uh, uh, we do produ production scale genomic sequencing. So we do all the preparation all the way down to annotation, but we don't make all the tools. Um, the next step in the sort of the pipeline would be variant detection. So once you've aligned all of those short reads back to the human in reference, you'll find that the person that you just did the sequencing on is different from the human reference. And so we catalog all of those and we try to detect them. The difficulty in those uh, sort of operations is that every step along this way is error prone. And so if uh, alignment were perfect, variant detection would be simple, but it, alignment's not even close to perfect. And so every step is really complicated and there's competing uh, tools at every step. And so one of the challenges we face is how do we build pipelines to do this at scale uh, and allow the researchers also to swap out tools and evaluate new tools easily. Um, and so the final process that we tend to do is called annotation, where there are people that have databases of sort of how does the DNA relate back to proteins and drugs and different things, and how, how do we give that back to researchers so that they can make breakthroughs in curing Alzheimer's, for instance. So another backdrop, to this whole sort of conversation is 
just how quickly the, the cost to sequence a genome has dropped. So back when they did the Human Genome Project, it was roughly $100 million to sequence those first four genomes. Uh, after that, it just got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And you can see in this slide, Moore's law is just a straight line because this is a semi-log plot. So each time that you drop down on this axis is a factor of 10, another factor of 10, and so on. And so as genetic sequencing got cheaper and cheaper, we just kept doing more and more of it. And what you run into is this orchestration problem, that things that worked well for orchestrating the analysis of one genome, now you've got 1,000 genomes, and now you want to do cross comparisons and things like that. So back in uh, about 2006, we started uh, building this genome modeling system. And roughly what the landscape looked like then was a lot of the file-based programs. So the community had built up programs to do an, uh, either alignment or variant detection or, and, and different uh, annotations. But you know they're long-running, non-interactive programs, mostly third-party to us at MGI. And they don't really stack together well. Like you can write bash scripts for them or you can you know, sort of weave them together. But because they all have different interfaces, they don't really work well. And so you end up with this sort of building block tower that's really fragile. You just touch it and the whole thing falls apart. And so we started to sort of want to build something more like Legos. So we wrapped uh, all of these third-party processes in Perl. Not our favorite choice, but it is sort of the community standard in bioinformatics. Uh, we exposed all of those uh, command line program, or all those programs back to the command line with a uniform interface and started to make automated pipelines so that we could scale up as genetic sequencing costs came down. And so as sequencing costs came down, we started doing more of it. I wanted to kind of show this. Uh, this is data from our sequencing center in the inset that shows uh, from 2007, it might be hard to see up there, from 2007 to 2009, that it just looks like a hockey stick. It's just, we're doing more of it. Um, it was not uncommon for us to have every quarter, we were doing more sequencing that quarter than had ever been done in the history of humankind, like just at that center. And so um, it's, it's an amazing sort of atmosphere to be in when things are growing so fast. And so the genome modeling system worked great for building the first handful of pipelines. But we wanted to make it easier to build pipelines and to allow researchers to sort of more quickly change the processes that they want to be in those pipelines. And so we pulled from the genome modeling system monolithic project out uh, what I call legacy workflow now. It didn't used to be called legacy workflow. It was just called workflow. But now it's legacy workflow. And it was nice because it had a declarative uh, way to describe your workflow instead of it all being in code and lost in all those interactions, you had one document that said, this is the processes that will be executed. And they could have dependencies on one another. Uh, it integrated with our data center management platform. So we have our own data center, which might make some of you guys jealous. Um, and we use IBM's LSF uh, to manage that data center. So what we can say is, you know, I have a job, and it's going to take two weeks, and it's going to use 32 gigs of RAM go schedule it somewhere in our data center, and LSF manages that for us. And so Legacy Workflow interacted with that for us. Um, it introduced uh, this concept of parallel by. So a lot of what we were doing was scaling up an orchestration rather than like the genomes weren't themselves getting any bigger. And so what we had uh, as a concept is sort of like map reduce, but without the reduce. So we would say, run this operation, but do, do it for every chromosome, or do it for every variant, for instance. Um, and it had centralized tracking of all the workflows that were being run at the center. And so that was really nice to give uh, managers and people who are you know, uh, in charge of projects and whatnot. So fast forward an another couple of years, and we're doing even more uh, sequencing than ever before. Uh, for reference, I've put a green box over the previous inset that I had. And so you can see that like, we just keep dwarfing ourselves every couple of years. And so legacy workflow was working for those years. It, it helped us to move forward. But you know, over those years, the features sort of started to fade into the background, and we started to hit some limitations. Legacy workflow couldn't scale up. 
So we started to have cohorts of tens of thousands of people, and we wanted to do cross comparisons. It just couldn't scale up. It would just choke. Um, they, we started to notice that it was unfortunate that it was really highly coupled to the Perl programming language. And it had a bunch of hooks back into the genome modeling system itself. And so other people couldn't easily adopt it. And finally, it represented all the workflows just as DAGs, which is totally common within workflow engines if you've looked into them. But often what we want to do is not just a directed acyclic graph. And so I'll give you a sort of a, a preview of what we're, what we're moving towards. And so uh, directed acyclic graphs, they're great because they can uh, encode the dependencies between your various processes. They're great because they can split out and do concurrency really well, but they can't do choice, not at runtime anyway. And so you have to choose everything you want to do before you encode it into the DAG. Um, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to make choices at runtime. Most common way to do that is to use a finite state machine. They're really good at doing choices at runtime, but they can't do concurrency. And so that's not a great choice. And often what you end up with if you adopt somebody else's workflow engine that only does DAGs is that you have a DAG of FSMs. And so then you've sort of mixed your abstractions. And um, so what we decided to do is encode at the very lowest level all of our workflows in, uh, in a Petri net. And I assume that most people haven't heard of Petri nets. We hadn't when we uh, sort of dug into this. But they've been uh, really helpful for us. They're called place transition nets, but they're named after the guy who invented them. Uh, I can't remember his first name, but his last name's Petri. And they can do both concern, concurrency and choice. They can actually uh, do more than DAGs and FSMs, um, but they, they cover those use cases really well. I'll give you really the basics of those just as a teaser or whatever, and then we'll get back to, the, to what we've built, uh, the Tarot workflow service. So in Petri nets, uh, you basically have uh, places and transitions. Those are the only two concepts other than uh, directed arcs. And you can only connect a place to a transition and a transition to a place. So it's a bipartite graph representation. Um, it's, they they uh, evolve very simply. All, the only rule is that a transition will fire if and only if all of its input places have a token. And after they fire, they place a token in all of their outputs. And for that reason, there's actually a pretty uh, large mathematical background to the, or like sort of foundation to these. People have analyzed their behaviors. Um, they're well understood. We, um, we use them to do both choice and concurrency. And this is sort of an example of how you can do that. Um, so on the left, you can see this is an example of concurrency. So you, you make a transition so that when you start with just a token at the top, now you've got two tokens or n tokens. This example is just two. And then you use those transitions that are called launch process here to actually have a side effect. In our case, it's sending a webhook somewhere else to launch a process. And then, so then there'll be two tokens down here in the launch state, but there won't be anything in the finished state. And so then we have another way to, uh, in our service to say for those, uh, for those launch process to, to processes to say that they're done. And then when they do say they're done, when they all say they're done, then there's this join transition that allows you to continue on in your uh, in your DAG or in your, in your workflow. You can also do choice. Choice uh, sort of follows a very similar pa uh, pattern where you have a transition that just uh, starts, uh, you have a transition that says it's just launch process. It has a side effect in launching a process in some other service. And then there's just two places. And so there's that choice that that service gets to make. Did your process succeed? Or did it fail? And then what happens is once you place a token in one of those two places, it consumes all the tokens from its input place and it puts them in its output place. And so you don't ever get the, the behavior of cleanup and continue both happening, for instance. So what we did with uh, Petri is we made a highly optimized implementation of Petri. And we sort of think of it as assembly code. 
Like nobody really wants to work in Petri because it's a pretty far from what you want to do. There's a bunch of boilerplate essentially. And so we made a uh, flow on top of Petri. It uses Petri as the backend, but it's still encoded your workflows as DAGs because that's how people think of workflows. But it allowed your DAGs, uh, DAGs of FSMs to be uh, if underneath uh, sort of, I don't know, I'm stuttering now. I apologize. Uh, to be driven by a, a more um, mathematically robust backend. Okay, so flow. Uh, all right, so flow met our needs of scaling up really nicely because we made it service oriented. We had, um, we had solved our issues of being able to scale up in both the number of workflows we could run at once, which we usually run thousands at a time, and we were able to run workflows that were tens of thousands of nodes large. Um, it was really reliable, partly because of its service orientation. If any of the services went down, there were redundant services that could pick it up. It had some limitations though. Um, because it tied back in with our legacy system, um, we made some decisions in order to do that in a timely manner that basically made it not usable by, the, by you guys. And so it stores all of its status in our legacy database. It represents everything in the old XML format, which people find cumbersome. And it has a lot of really complicated heterogeneous APIs. Uh, so this sort of shows you where Flow came in. Uh, around 2012, we were developing it. It's been in use for the last few years. It's really scaled up nicely for us. Um, you can see that we've been doing even more uh, sequencing. It's, it looks like it kind of leveled off, but then this last year, new processes have been invented and we're back you know, vastly outpacing Moore's Law. And so Flow has been really good for us and it's sort of, I think of it as Taro 0.1 or something. Uh, Taro is built on top of the same technologies that we use in Flow. So what did we want to do with Taro? We basically want the same ability to scale up that Flow has, but we want it to be service oriented with RESTful APIs so that anybody can use it and it's not tied to Perl and it's not tied to any programming languages. We're gonna use JSON for all of our workflow descriptions as well as all of our uh, response bodies and, and uh, we wanna have a pluggable job execution system so that we're not tied to just running things on a command line or just running things in our LSF cluster. We could use Sun Grid Engine or you could use AWS. And we want outside adoption so that you know, the maintenance burden moving forward isn't tied to us and we can, uh, we can squash bugs and everybody can use it. And so Michael's gonna tell you basically what our architecture looks like and then at the end, if there's time, I'll try and run a live demo. So, Michael. Okay, thanks Dave. Okay, uh, so uh, Dave just got done telling you about the history um, and how we uh, got here. So I'm gonna pick it up and uh, tell you a little bit about the architecture of Taro. Taro is comprised of uh, three types of services. We have the uh, Petri service, which is uh, responsible just for executing the Petri nets. We have the workflow service, which um, executes workflows. It's what um, users of Taro primarily interact with is the workflow service. They submit workflows there. The workflow service then instigates interactions with the other services in the Taro system. And the workflow service also manages the inputs and outputs of the tasks in the workflow. Uh, then the uh, third kind of service is the job service. Right now we have two varieties of the job service. Um, the first kind uh, is the shell command job service. And uh, that kind of job service allows you to execute a command on some execution host uh, the LSF uh, job service uh, dispatches commands to our data center using IBM's platform LSF. Uh, the services uh, also uh, have a few things in common. Uh, they are all written in Python, expose REST APIs. Uh, the requests accept and respond with uh, JSON documents. If you post a JSON document to one of the terrorist services, then it validates that JSON using JSON schema and all of the services have uh, webhooks that users can subscribe to uh, so that uh, users of the services can listen for events. 
Okay, uh, before we move on, I'm going to cover some terminology that we use when talking about Taro. A task is something that you'd like to complete in your workflow. Um, think of a task as a goal, not how you would achieve that goal, but um, just as, as a goal. Uh, tasks may have inputs and tasks may have uh, outputs. Um, the inputs and outputs for a tarot task are uh, small JSON documents. Uh, usually they'd have something in there like a uh, path to a file or uh, some sort of web resource that needs to be um, uh, used or created uh, during the uh, execution of a task. Uh, a workflow is thought of as a DAG of tasks and the inputs required to execute um, that DAG of tasks. Now, methods. Um, if, a, if a task is a goal, um, but how to, not how to complete the goal, a method is um, how you complete the, the goal of a task. It's a way to finish a task. We have two different kinds of methods in Tarot. We have the job method and the DAG method. Uh, when you execute a job method, that involves one of the job services, so that might be running a shell command or dispatching work to uh, the uh, LSF cluster. Uh, <clears throat> then anytime a task or method executes uh, in Tarot, we record that as an execution in our, uh, in our database. Okay, and this here is a graphical notation that we use uh, when uh, talking about Tarot. Uh, this is a uh, task. Uh, the gray box uh, represents the task itself. The inputs to the task are at the top, the outputs are at the bottom. In the middle are the methods uh, that the task has. Uh, every task has at least one method, but a task can have more than one method. If a task has uh, more than one method, uh, each method is executed in order. Um, the first method uh, to succeed, um, will stop the execution of, uh, uh, no, no methods will execute after the first uh, method has, su has succeeded. So um, if, if a task has two methods and the first one fails and the second one succeeds, then, um, then the task is considered successful. If both fail, then uh, the task is uh, considered a failure as a whole. Uh, here is an example of a task with uh, two methods and its corresponding PetriNet representation. Uh, the um, part of the PetriNet in the red box corresponds to method one and the part of the PetriNet in the blue box corresponds to method two. Uh, you see we're using our uh, choice pattern uh, here. And at the beginning of uh, executing this, uh, this task with two methods, uh, a token is placed here in the begin place uh, which enables this first transition, launching a process, and putting a token here. Um, then once the task has uh, succeeded or uh, uh, failed, uh, let's say it succeeded in this case, um, a token is placed here in the success place for the method. Um, and then uh, that, uh, that enables this transition here, and the entire task succeeds um, because this first method uh, had succeeded. Uh, in the other case, if this uh, first method had failed, um, then this transition is enabled and a token is put in the method failure place, which enables the method two to uh, fire. Um, and method two may either succeed or fail, um, causing the entire task to succeed or the entire task to um, uh, fail. Okay, so now you know a little bit about how we translate um, uh, tasks into petri nets. Uh, so let's talk about submitting a whole workflow to Tarot. Um, this sequence diagram uh, shows the different Tarot services, petri workflow and uh, a shell command uh, service. They're all running together. There's also um, an execution host represented here, um, and that's where the shell command service would, uh, would run a job that's launched. Um, the arrows represent uh, web requests between the uh, different Tarot services. Um, the uh, arrows in red are um, happening, uh, those are web requests that happen uh, because of a webhook that has been subscribed to by the workflow service. And uh, the green um, arrows are optional web requests that don't always have to happen when a uh, method executes. Um, but if you, if you use these optional web requests, you can uh, get and set um, inputs. So let's walk through this. Uh, the sequence diagram flows from top to bottom. So we start um, by submitting a workflow. Um, a user of the system submits a work, uh, workflow to the workflow service. 
the workflow service translates the workflow into a PetriNet representation and submits it to the Petri service, which then begins executing the PetriNet. Once the um, uh, PetriNet is uh, gotten to a place where the uh, first method uh, should uh, uh, fire, then that causes a um, webhook uh, to communicate back to the workflow service. Um, workflow then interprets that um, as a command to uh, execute a shell command on the uh, shell command service, which uh, once, the, once the shell command, that may not happen immediately, but once the shell command service is ready to uh, run that, that job, it'll communicate back to the workflow uh, service saying that the status of the job is now running. It actually launches the job on the execution host. Then that running job can um, communicate back to the uh, workflow service to get the inputs for the method or task and then uh, do its work on those inputs and then uh, optionally set outputs back to workflow uh, so that other jobs in the future can uh, use those outputs. Once the, once the job is finished, the shell command uh, service notices, uh, communicates the success back to workflow, and workflow communicates um, to Petri, uh, placing a token in the proper place of the PetriNet so that the PetriNet can continue executing um, until the PetriNet has completed successfully, which time the Petri service uh, tells workflow that all the work is done, and that's when the workflow is complete. Uh, so you see here that um, each service in the uh, Terra architecture uh, does exactly uh, one thing. The shell command service is only um, responsible for executing shell commands. It doesn't do anything else. It doesn't know anything about Petri nets. The Petri service only executes um, uh, Petri nets. And the workflow service um, you know, manages the interactions and, and handles inputs and outputs. Okay, so uh, here's a uh, more interesting practical example. Um, this actually happened at work a couple months ago. Uh, my boss came to me and said, Michael, we have a bunch of uh, VCF files. These VCF files contain genetic variants. Um, each file uh, represents um, all the variants for one sample, but um, in that sample, um, the, the variants cover many chromosomes. Uh, and we have a lot of these files. Uh, my task was to, um, to make it so that instead we had files um, that only covered one chromosome each um, but contained variants about many samples. And so how would you do this? Um, uh, the way I approached the problem is uh, I thought, well, if I can extract uh, from each of, the, uh, each of these VCF files information about a particular chromosome, then I could have uh, one file per um, input file uh, per chromosome. So, so each one of these here, so this just covers chromosome one for one of the uh, input VCF files and, uh, and so on. And then um, I would merge everything for chromosome one and create the, uh, the one resulting file that my boss wanted. And so how would I construct a workflow in Taro that um, does such a thing? Uh, so we start with tasks. Um, over here we have a task um, that uh, runs uh, tabx index. Uh, tabx index is a program that we have that uh, takes a VCF file and indexes it so it's easy to get the variance uh, for a particular chromosome out of the file. Uh, and that's uh, something useful and so we want to index these VCF files before we um, do anything else. Uh, so this uh, Indexing task was the first thing I thought of, but what if the index already existed for a particular VCF file? I wouldn't want to redo work um, by creating indexes that I already have. So um, instead I made the slightly more complicated task that has shortcut and execute. Uh, the job of shortcut is just to, to check quickly to see if uh, the VCF index already exists. Um, if no VCF index can be found, this first method here fails along the second method to um, execute and um, actually create the VCF index. And once that's done at the end, we have an index as our output of the task. Um, had, the, had the shortcut method found an index for the VCF file, the uh, shortcut would uh, succeed and the execute would never run. And so we would save the work of uh, creating indexes that we already have. Okay, so um, now we build on top of that. Uh, we're able in Tarot to, um, because we can embed DAGs uh, as methods in other tasks, we can uh, build up a, a workflow. 
in tarot. Uh, here I've wrapped um, two tasks. So we have the task that creates the index uh, for a VCF file, and then we have a second task whose job is to pull the variance for one chromosome out of the VCF file using the index that was created by the first step uh, and the VCF and uh, the chromosome, uh, the VCF file path and the chromosome that uh, we're interested in. And um, this whole task um, accepts as an input uh, one chromosome name and one VCF file path uh, and reports uh, the output VCF file that only has information for one chromosome. Uh, it abstracts away the idea of having to create an index on that file and um, the uh, and so you see here, uh, this is kind of the conceptual idea of what it's doing. It's taking a file that has um, information about many chromosomes and just giving you information about one chromosome. And uh, now I had uh, many VCF files to deal with, and, and so uh, we continue. Uh, then I modified the task. So this is the, pretty much the same larger task that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, but we changed it. Um, instead of accepting one VCF file, we accept a list of VCF files um, as one of the inputs. Still just one chromosome. We're still dealing with one chromosome name here. And also, um, we made this box blue uh, because uh, we're using the parallel by feature here. Uh, and that means that um, uh, this, this task will not just execute once on the entire list. It'll um, execute n times uh, one for each of the uh, VCF files that, uh, that have been input into this, uh, into this task. And the result is that we get um, uh, many uh, output VCF files, one for as many input VCF files that we have. And so what you have at the end is um, uh, instead of uh, a few files that um, contain information on all of the chromosomes, we just have um, a few files that contain information about one chromosome. But, uh, but our job's not done yet. So um, this slide kind of jumps ahead a little bit. Um, this, is the, this is the task you were just looking at with parallel by VCFs. Immediately after that, it takes the, all the output VCFs from, say, chromosome 1 and uses this task to, um, to join them together and create one output VCF. We wrap that whole, um, that whole uh, task, uh, or DAG of tasks, um, with a larger task that then does, uh, uh, accepts a list of chromosomes and uh, is parallel by chromosomes. And that pretty much uh, completes the whole job. Uh, this is what my boss wanted. Uh, we now have a, a workflow uh, in Taro that accepts a uh, list of uh, VCF files and a list of chromosomes uh, that you'd like to query and produces a uh, set of uh, VCF files with information for one chromosome each. OK. Uh, when we submit that uh, workflow to the Taro system, Taro responds with a, uh, you probably can't read it all, um, with a URL. And that URL um, represents uh, the workflow. And you can use uh, a command that we supply in our SDK to um, uh, get this kind of command line view of the uh, um, processing of the workflow. Um, you um, might see right at the, at the top, um, we have the uh, status of the entire workflow is succeeded. Um, then all the, all the lines below represent one execution um, inside the net, so all the, uh, the tasks and methods as they executed. Um, and they all have statuses of succeeded, um, and, except for a few that have failed. Uh, what you'll notice is that the, the failures are uh, some of the shortcuts. Uh, failed. Like uh, the first time that we uh, tried to um, shortcut on indexing a VCF file, um, the shortcut method didn't find an index. And so the shortcut method failed, which allowed um, the, um, the next method in that task, um, which actually indexed the VCF, to run. And that succeeded. And then later on in this, um, uh, later on in this uh, workflow execution, uh, we see a shortcut on uh, indexing a VCF that succeeds because um, the earlier in executing the workflow, we had already done the work, and we don't repeat that work. Uh, we uh, create this view by uh, doing a topological sort on the uh, uh, workflow DAG, uh, and then show the, the executions uh, related to, uh, to those tasks uh, in order here, uh, with the tabbing to uh, represent uh, how deep inside the, the workflow the execution is. OK, so now um, 
we're going to talk a little bit about how we developed and tested uh, workflow uh, for development methodology. We used uh, CMAT, which is the software engineering method and uh, uh, theory. Uh, it uh, splits a software project into several elements. Uh, you can de determine the state of your project by assessing the maturity of each of the elements and then uh, choose how you'll proceed in your software project um, by looking at the like, most immature element and, and deciding how to uh, uh, increase the maturity of that element. Like if you uh, don't have very uh, 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 clear ideas of who your stakeholders are, um, then your, Im uh, your project is immature in that element and you might choose to uh, uh, perform activities to identify stakeholders. Uh, then for designing the software system itself, we followed 12-factor. Uh, uh, most importantly from 12-factor, uh, we have made our processes uh, stateless, and so Terra runs as a set of uh, stateless processes that connect to backing services uh, to get their job done. Uh, the backing services that are outside of Terra hold all of the state and the um, uh, the stateless uh, tarot processes can be um, scaled up or down or destroyed and come back and um, the system is uh, still pretty stable. For issue tracking, we use um, GitHub uh, issues. Uh, tarot is divided into many sub-modules uh, and so we keep our issues um, on, the, uh, on the GitHub repo that is relevant uh, for, um, for that issue and so our issues are spread across uh, many sub-modules. So we use Waffle.io to then aggregate all those issues together and we have this one Kanban style view of all of our issues related to Terra across all of the Terra sub-modules. Okay, uh, now uh, here's some metrics about our, the Terra code base. So you can see um, our language choice is mostly uh, Python. We have a little bit of Lua in the Petri service uh, to support interactions with uh, Redis. Um, we also have the Perl SDK uh, uh, to support our uh, uh, legacy infrastructure at uh, TGI, MGI. And uh, the, notice also that the slot count for shell command and LSF, the um, job services, is uh, pretty low. Uh, we are able to satisfy the uh, job service API in under 300 lines of Python, so uh, it's pretty easy to make a new um, job service uh, to extend Taro uh, to whatever kind of job service you need if uh, the shell command or LSF service doesn't meet your needs. Okay, and this is how we do our continuous integration for uh, Taro. Uh, like I said, we have many sub-modules uh, for Taro, um, and we have one main repo. Uh, anytime a, a PR is made on a sub-module, then that, um, that PR uh, being open causes a sub-module test to run, usually on Travis CI. Uh, once a, um, once a um, branch is merged for any of the sub-modules, that triggers uh, the system test. And uh, if the system test succeeds, then uh, we update the uh, successful configuration of commits in our main uh, Terra repo on GitHub. Uh, you'll notice a couple places we use Jenkins uh, internally to do some testing for LSF. That's because LSF has a proprietary um, license, so we don't run that on Travis uh, CI. We run that, um, those tests internally. And um, uh, Platform LSF has a proprietary license, not the, uh, not the LSF service for Taro. Uh, and then also our system tests, uh, we found this was the easiest way to update our uh, sub-modules on GitHub was to just run this test internally. Um, and so that's why our system tests uh, run on Jenkins in-house. Okay, and then in production, uh, we take our uh, Terra system test and we uh, reuse it as a production monitor. It runs a small workflow on the production Terra uh, and just make sure that the uh, production Terra is up and running. Uh, Jenkins schedules these to happen every um, you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, normally this stays blue, meaning that everything's okay, but when this turns red, we can uh, look at our Kibana dashboard uh, to inspect the logs and try and get some insight into what has gone wrong. Um, all the uh, Terra logs in our production deployment are um, sent to Logstash uh, and indexed with Elasticsearch. Okay, and uh, this is how we have chosen to deploy our uh, processes for Terra in our, our production setting. Uh, the uh, Taro processes themselves, uh, they all run on Deus, um, or they all can run on Deus. 
Uh, we actually, these ones with the stars next to them, um, these are workers for the Shell Command and LSF service. We, we actually have those run on specialized execution hosts, so we do not deploy them internally to the uh, um, to Deus, uh, but they run on separate execution hosts. Then all of our backing services run on, uh, not on Deus, on uh, separate VMs. Uh, we use Celery for um, messaging uh, between uh, uh, different uh, components of each service. So all of our services use Celery, and we use um, RabbitMQ for the uh, uh, messaging broker and uh, Redis for the results backend, but you might make other choices in your deployment of Taro. Uh, but we do need Redis um, for the Petri service for the storage of Petri nets. Um, so you see that right here. Also, the, the workflow and LSF services um, require a relational database. We are using uh, PostgreSQL. Um, soon the shell command um, service will also um, need a uh, backing relational database, but it doesn't right now, so it's, in, uh, it's not highlighted. Okay, and uh, that's how we do our production deployment, but um, for development and uh, testing, we actually run Taro on our laptops uh, uh, you can get started with Taro by uh, doing a git clone of our uh, repository, um, cd into that uh, clone Taro directory, uh, do a git submodule update uh, init to update all the submodules, and then uh, do a vagrant up. Once you do a vagrant up, all of the backing services are running on your vagrant VM. Uh, also, the Taro services are running there as well. If you um, set this optional run tests equals one, then um, a set of tests will run against those um, Taro services and uh, populate, have the side effect of populating your database uh, with um, some test data. Okay, I think uh, now it's all I'm not gonna do. Oh, we're all out? All right. Well, uh, then I'm gonna move on uh, to the conclusion. Uh, so yeah, Terra is designed to carry out a large complex uh, workflows. It's uh, service oriented with uh, simple RESTful APIs. Uh, it's focused in scope, free and open source. It's under active development at GitHub here at the genome organization slash Terra. Uh, these are the people involved in uh, Taro development. Um, uh, Travis, uh, Mark, and Charlotte are um, not uh, actively developing Taro anymore. They've moved on to other projects, uh, but me and Dave and uh, uh, Josh McMichael, who's not here today, are actively uh, developing on Taro. Uh, we also, we're part of a larger institute. This is all possible because of the, the work that um, everyone does at the McDonald Genome Institute. and. Um, through our funding from the NIH and the National Human Genome Research Institute. Thank you. <laughs>